Good morning, Glory America, Bonjour, hi, Canada, here you go live from Studio Winterthur in the north. Many of you have asked, why did I get out of D.C. early? And it, I mean, you've never been in D.C. in June, if you have to ask that question. And they, they thought it was because the crossbow season, that doesn't even open until October up here. Crossbow, you can't use your crossbow until October. So it's not because of that, it's just because, you ever been in D.C. after summer arrives? It's just, it's not really habitable. That's why people get cranky. Lots of news. Most important thing of the day is that I, my pre-publication copy of Daniel Silva's new book, Portrait of an Unknown Woman, arrived. Now, you can order yours for delivery whenever it's available, but uh, I got mine. So there. It's not for, and it's away from Mrs. Radio Blogger. That's the best thing. It didn't come anywhere near Mrs. Radio Blogger, so it's not going to walk out of the studio like a C.J. Box uh, book. The big news yesterday, of course, Supreme Court uh, said that the Second Amendment oddly means what it says. Uh, it's a plain reading. I was on uh, with special report last night with Brett Baer, uh, joined by the estimable Molly Hemingway and Leslie Marshall, and got asked out of the box, explain it, and it's 136 pages, but I did this in 53 seconds, cut number 22. Hugh, Maybe. significant, uh, this gun ruling today. The impact nationwide? Well, there are six other states, Brett, that have the same sort of uh, regime about issuing permits that New York State does, a regime that was struck down as unconstitutional under the plain language of the Second Amendment today. Justice Alito, he wrote a concurring opinion. Six judges, six justices uh, agreed, uh, and Justice Thomas wrote the majority opinion. But Justice Alito said, look, what we're deciding today is very simply put, Americans have the right to go out of their house and carry their weapon in self-defense. They don't have to beg a bureaucrat to get that permit. And 43 states already agree with that. The seven states who have uh, ask me, may give you the permit regimes. Their laws are unconstitutional. No one should be surprised by this. It's been 10 years coming and being made explicit, but it's not a surprise. It's not a surprise. And the hysteria on the left, the story of the morning that just ticks me off, it, it, it's, it's nothing other than woke big law. Big law are law firms that are bigger than 300 lawyers. And woke big law includes Kirkland and Ellis. The single best Supreme Court advocate in the United States is named Paul Clement. He is the former Solicitor General of the United States. Until yesterday, he was a partner at Kirkland & Ellis. He won the gun case. He always wins. On the single occasion where I not only got input, but may have had decisive input on who would represent a friend in front of the United States Supreme Court, I said, do whatever you have to, but go get Paul Clement. And I've never met Paul Clement. He's good friends with Carol platt Lebow on the Salem uh, Media Editorial Board, longtime friend of mine, but they went to law school together at Harvard. I just know who wins at the Supreme Court. Originally, the single best Supreme Court litigator in the United States was Ted Olson, but Ted is old. And Ken Starr was second best, and then he became best as, as Ted got older and Ken got older. But now it's Paul Clement. So if you've got everything on the line, you want to win at the Supreme Court, you hire Paul Clement. And he became a lawyer at Kirkland & Ellis, which is a big law. Now it's a big blue law law firm. And he left yesterday because he won the gun case. Uh, the, the Wall Street Journal has an editorial about this today. And if you are a client of Kirkland & Ellis, I'm not telling you to leave. I'm just telling you they're not going to be your lawyers uh, if you're a conservative. They're not going to do their, their best. They're not going to do their best. You have to ask yourself... Who is running this firm that they would let Paul Clement leave? Because they just let the best Supreme Court litigator in the United States leave. So if you're a K&E client, you got to ask yourself, do we really want that firm, which puts politics ahead of expertise when it comes to law? Do we really want a woke law firm? And I would encourage you to read, you won your gun case, you're fired. Kirkland and Ellis tells Paul Clement and a partner to dump their Second Amendment clients. They refuse and resign. It's a great editorial. It's in the Wall Street Journal. We also got uh, on the panel last night to the 1-6 hearings. And a big surprise, a big surprise for me. I learned something from the 1-6 hearings yesterday. Cut number 23. Hugh, uh, what do you make of this hearing today and overall uh, how these have, have kind of come out methodically? Well, today I learned something new, something and that's unusual. I learned that the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel, Steve Engel, I've only met once and had a long conversation with once, but he's very highly esteemed in Washington, D.C., and he served in that job four years for President Trump. 
When asked by President Trump what he would do if he fired the acting attorney general and replaced him with a Trump loyalist further down, he said, I'll quit. And the president backed off. That's news. That's the first time I've learned something from these hearings. And so the reason the public is fundamentally disinterested in what is going on in the Nancy Pelosi 1-6 committee is that there is precious little news in these hearings. But when there is some, I notice it. And I note that the president got pushed back from one of his most trusted aides. And we ought to know that. We ought to know that because it tells you that they had this big meeting in the Oval and uh, the former president is looking for a way to somehow proceed with a challenge, and he's looking for DOJ to seize machines. Or I mean, he's exploring options. It's not a coup, by the way. The president's just asking people, what can I do? What can I do if I put in a new AG? And Steve Engel looks at him and says, I'll quit. He's been there for four years. He's the assistant attorney general in the Office of Legal Counsel. Smart guy office. OLC is where the smart guys go. I was not in OLC. I was in counterintelligence special assistant for two attorneys general. I liked my job and I learned a lot and it gave my, when my hair is white, doing that job for two attorney general. Uh, but, and then working for Dick Hauser, who's like working for, if you've seen Ben Hur when Charlton Heston is rowing, Dick Hauser is the guy with the whip. All right, now he's playing golf in Florida and asking people for strokes uh, on the side. But I, that's why I have white hair, those two jobs. But the smart guys, guys like, John Roberts, Mike Ludig, uh, Ted Olson, Ken Starr, they all hang out at OLC. They all would go down there and they would talk about footnotes. And, and I am, I'm, I'm all for footnotes, but Steve Engel's a really smart guy. He's not, by the way, a, a, a woke lawyer. He's a smart lawyer. He just said to the president, I'll, I'll quit if you do that, because if you fire the acting attorney general to put in the acting head of the civil division, who is actually running environmental, uh, in order to seize machines in Georgia, I'm out of here. And that's when it stopped. You know, the president poked around, pushed, got told, no, you can't do that. It's like every developer I've ever known uh, does the same sort of thing. Can't, why can't I build 400 units on one acre? Well, you, you know, we're not going to do that. And then they say, okay, I'll, I'll take three. That's how developers are. I've told you that forever. Finally, and most importantly, maybe you have not seen the New York Times documentary on Jewel. Uh, move fast and vape things. It's fascinating. Jewel, I'm not a big vaping fan. Don't get me wrong. I think vaping is a menace to kids because that's messing up their lungs. And uh, vaping was originally conceived as a way to get people to stop smoking. And Jewel is, it comes out of the Stanford hothouse and out of the Silicon Valley, move fast and break things. That, thus the name, move fast and vape things. And as the documentary says, Juul is the apple of vaping. Yesterday, the FDA shut down Juul, or began the process of shutting down Juul, J-U-U-L. And uh, this was coming up. Brad had signaled we would be talking about this. And we had just talked about fentanyl. Now, remember, 107,000 Americans died from fentanyl overdoses in the last year. So it comes my turn to talk about it, and I know that FDA and Jewel are on the agenda. Cut number 24, Jacob, please. But Hugh, I, I don't hear anything from the administration about fentanyl, oh, and those numbers tomb. are through the roof. It's a tomb, and the fentanyl that all, all of us agree is the number one part of the border crisis is what we have to be focused on. It killed 107,000 Americans last year. It is a wide open border. I know you wanted to talk about the FDA and Jewel, yeah. and, and I have to say, why are we focusing part of the federal government, the FDA, on regulating Juul when we can't regulate the border? Why do we assume the federal government can do anything when it can't do the first thing, which is to control the border? As Molly said, the cartels control the border, not the administration. So why would we trust the FDA, which had a very bad year anyway in the course of COVID? They blew the Johnson & Johnson pause. They blew, in fact, they blew a lot of the Abbott laboratory process. They do not have a great reputation right now, and they're shutting down Juul. Yeah. I'm not a fan of Juul. Why in the world would we trust them when the government can't do anything on its number one job? That, 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 to me, is the number one question. Why do you believe the government can do anything right when they can't control the border? And they don't control the border. As Molly Hemingway said, the cartels control the border. And Joe Biden has given up on the border. Joe Biden has instead issued Title IX regs, which I'll come back and talk about afterwards. It had nothing to do with Title IX. And President Nixon signed, signed Title IX 50 years ago this month, maybe this weekend, 50 years ago. And I kind of know a little bit about Title IX, and I'll tell you about it after the break. You're listening to Friday morning edition of The Hugh Hewitt Show.
Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. That music means the official movie critic of the Hugh Hewitt show rolling around in his unlimited airline miles is Sonny Bunch. Of course, you read Sonny in the Washington Post. You also listen to his podcast across the movie aisle and the bulwark goes to the movie. Good morning, Sonny. Why is uh, Lightyear a stinker? Uh, yeah, we, we, we barely touched on this last week. Uh, so look, the movie itself is just not, not very good. It, it's a kid movie that bores kids, uh, judging by the kids who were in my theater when I saw it, they were just all running around the theater. I haven't seen kid zone out like that at the movies, uh, in a long time. It's one of these, it's, it's a weird movie in that. Uh, Disney slash Pixar wasn't entirely sure how to market it, which is to say they weren't sure how to explain it to people. Like, why did why did this exist? What was its what was its purpose? Um, and the, the premise is fairly simple. It is, uh, you know, in 1995, Andy, the little boy in Toy Story, right? He went and saw a movie, and that he loved that movie so much that it blew his mind, and that stuck with him, you know, forever. And he wanted to get a Buzz Lightyear toy. Uh, to replace his Woody doll, and this is that movie, right? So ah. the, the, the premise, the premise of the movie, very simple. Premise of the movie, very simple, actually. Despite the the difficulty in selling it to folks, um, and it's just not very good. It's like a, a, a fellow critic described it as an anti space opera, which is is a good way of putting it. You know, the the premise of the film is uh, Buzz Lightyear is on a mission, uh, an exploratory mission. He's got a ship full of hibernating. Uh, colonists, he, he, there, there's a, a message diverting him out of hypersleep or whatever, right? That he has to, he's got to go see what is, uh, what the computer has diverted him for. Um, when they get to the, the planet that he is going to check out, uh, he gets into an accident with the ship and they're stuck there. Uh, and the rest of the movie is him trying to, uh, to essentially get the get the get the get the colony off of the this world and back into space, right? Um, and to do so, he has to test out some light speed crystals that'll uh, that'll get that'll get the the colony moving again. And every time he does this, thanks to the horrors of time dilation, right? Every time, every day for him is four years uh, on this on this colony. So he sees his friends and. Uh, co-workers grow up around him, have families, have lives, while he is stuck in this, you know, kind of never-ending loop of testing the crystals. Okay, so like... It's, wow, it's, that it's sounds weirdly, boring. It's, it's a weirdly heavy premise, right? Like, at least for the first half of the movie. And then the second half of the movie, where, where all the action is supposed to be, is just, just really dull and boring and obvious. Uh, you know, he assembles a team of misfits to go up against uh, Emperor Zerg, who has uh, come to the planet and has surrounded the colony and is is trying to, uh, you know, take over. Um, uh, and it's just so, it is so... So, Sonny, how can you it. screw up a light year movie? I mean, uh, first of all, well, they didn't use Tim Allen. And Tim Allen, I don't think he was not used because he's a senator. He's a, like a Jimmy Stewart Republican. He's not some fire-breathing conservative. He's not Ted Nugent. Or, you know, he's not crazy. He's not out there. He's just a normal guy, just a normal Republican. They didn't use Tim Allen, who is the voice of Buzz Lightyear. What is that choice about? Yeah, I mean, there there, there is an argument that he was not used because, you know, he is, he is a conservative. He's on Twitter. He's saying problematic things, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if that's even, I don't even know if that 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 is the case. I mean, I, I think they may have just thought, oh, you know, Chris Evans is a big star. So when we we need a big star for this big extensive movie. We got to get we got to get Chris Evans as if anybody cares. As if anybody, uh, and they got to do seven of them. They might have said, "Well, we got to do seven of these over the next uh, twenty five years," and Chris Evans is available for seven of them. Right, right, right. So I, I like I feel like Chris Evans is just a big expensive mistake more than more than a like thumb in the statement. eye politically of anybody. I like I really I, I don't think that that much that much went into it in terms of the the overthinking of it that said that said i mean it's a huge mistake because the, it doesn't even make sense within the universe of the film it would be one thing if you know uh the, this was the movie about like the real guy buzz lightyear was based on right the quote unquote real guy if that if that was the way you wanted to go with it okay maybe you you have a different voice but it's literally the it's literally the movie that the toy is based on. There's no reason to change the voice. Just like within the 
the universe of the 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 film in terms of logical sense. There's no reason whatsoever to change them. It's dumb. It's dumb. It's pointless. It it it, it created a dislocation between the audience and and the character. And another one is that the the character is simply designed differently. He looks different. He doesn't quite look like Buzz Lightyear, which again, like you're, you're talking about a movie for kids. And what do kids want? Kids basically just want a movie where toys come to life. Yeah. Right. And they want the same Buzz Lightyear that they've watched 80 times already in Toy Stories 1 through 100. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Now, Sonny, I got a question for you about marketing. Uh, I learned this when the ARC came out, the Russell Crowe, you know, ARC movie, whatever that was called, Noah or whatever. They created a controversy. I mean, they actually, and I know the people who did this. They created a controversy. Oh, conservative Christians won't like this movie because of the way that we portray certain elements. And they just made it up. Conservative Christians didn't care about the movie. It was a stinker. And so I think most of the so-called controversy about this is made up by Disney to try and get attention to a movie that's just a stinker. Uh, Which controversy is that? That there's a same-sex kiss, which, you know basically wouldn't register on my radar to begin with. Uh, and I don't think anyone is not going to a stinker movie. It's just that movies are expensive. I took my grandkids to see a movie. I took them to see Bad Guys, and I loved it. But, you know, I was kind of stunned at what it cost to go to the movies with, you know, three kids. Yeah, yeah, no, it's expensive. I mean, I, there's there's certainly a, uh, a ginned-up controversy element to uh, a lot of... Uh, there's there's a type of marketing that is basically well you know pe- some people aren't going to like this and you right. know, because those people are bad you saw the same thing during the Obi Wan uh, show right where the uh, there there was a supposedly a controversy about some Star Wars fans didn't like it because the you know the lead villain in the in the show is a black woman and I I I mean I, I'm sure there's some YouTube commenter somewhere who was complaining about that but the, the real problem with that show is that it's just boring. It's boring. Um, it's, it's so it's slow. Not, it's not, it's not a not ten part well one part series. It looks <laughs> kind of cheap and yeah it's it's a two hour movie stretched into a four hour TV show stretched over six episodes. I mean it just like it it is it it's very thin. It feels very thin. Um, the, the Lightyear thing is interesting because, uh, look, you know, my understanding um, from kind of what I've been what I've been hearing and what I've been reading is that initially Disney had actually taken taken the same sex kiss and all that stuff out of the movie, and one of the things that Disney employees got very this this angered Disney employees who thought that Disney was you know abandoning them in the face of uh, horrible oppression by Ron DeSantis, et cetera, et cetera. So Disney put it back in, which then caused, uh, you know, a a second set of controversies with everybody. I think if this had happened, if this movie had come out two years ago, before, you know, the fight over the quote-unquote don't say gay bills, right? Oh, we don't even call it that. It's Disney employees, LGBTQ employees of Disney are electing Ron DeSantis president, and they should know that because he's going to be president because of them. I think it's, I think it's, I, it, we've discussed this before. I think it's a terrible, terrible fight for Disney to get into. And I think, I think CEO Bob Chapek did the smart thing by trying to avoid all of it as much as possible and then cave to his employees, which was foolish. Um, but the, you know, if you, if, if this movie had come out two years ago, there would have been some eye rolls amongst, you know, your kind of regular uh, culture war conservative types who would just be like, oh God, Disney, Disney with another, you know they're really rubbing our faces in the gay stuff, blah blah. But because it because it it is coming out in controversy with all of these, or I'm sorry, in concert with all of these other controversies, it is it is it just is kind of snowballing for Disney. It's a bad. It's I mean it's just bad timing more than. Do, do you remember that but rule problem- of, of of politics, which is uh, the best way to understand bureaucratic behavior is to assume it's been taken over by its worst enemies. The best way to understand Disney employees is to assume that they are Republicans working secretly to elect Ron DeSantis president. <laughs> that's, that's a funny way to look at it, and it certainly is. Again, like you, when you when you have you when you have this reaction to look, we we can discuss the merits or demerits of the bill. I think it's overly broad, but I think it's at least defensible. You know, when you when you have this crazy reaction to it, that's like, well, why is Ron DeSantis trying to oppress us and, and kill us and force us all back in the closet. And then on top of that, you have the executives trying to suit their employees by saying, look, no, we're, we're intentionally inserting 
you know, gay messaging into the movies, and we're trying to change the culture. This is how we change the culture. We don't change the culture by laws. We change the culture by our movies. And then two months after that, you have this come out, which, again, like, had been in the works for years. It's not like it was, it's not like they, they gin this up to, uh, you know, um, to, to placate people. They actually had to put it back in. They took it out and they put it back in. I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's really foolish. It's, oh, it's, it's such a, it's uh, such a, a traffic jam. Tell me something good to see, Sonny. I don't care well, if it's on streaming, which may or may not ever work up here at Studio Winter Thur, or, uh, um, at the theater, which may or may not be around Studio Winter Thur. Uh, well, I really loved I really loved Barry on HBO Max. I, I think we may have talked about this a little bit last week. That just wrapped up its its run. Uh, Hacks on HBO Max uh, also very good. Um, Barry is 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 in its third season. It's about a hitman who goes to Hollywood and learns to act. And oh yeah, uh, he's trying to like that, trying that's to a, trying that's to Winkler to Henry Winkler in that right? What's that? Henry Winkler. Yes, that's the show with Henry Winkler uh, as a he's a aging he's an aged acting coach who has like er, earned a lot of enemies in Hollywood and this this season is very much uh, about his trying to right some of his past wrongs in in Hollywood. But the show is about this this assassin who's played by Bill Hader and it is about the need it, it's about people who try to. Uh, say they are better without having suffered any consequences for the things that they have done in the past. It's, it's really interesting. I think people should uh, should watch it. I love it. Um, and again, the show Hacks, which is about a Joan Rivers-esque comedian who is trying to mount a comeback show. This season, not, not quite as good as the first season. It meanders a bit. Uh, but the back half is very strong. I liked it a lot. Uh, both those shows worth watching. Um, there, there's a little movie out right now. I think it's just in New York and LA. Uh, it's going to expand in, in the next couple of weeks, but it's called, uh, Marcel, the shell with shoes on, which is, Oh my goodness. I saw it. the preview to that. You cannot get me to go to that. Tell me um, that you, it's, it's very, it's very adorable, Hugh. It's a, it's an adorable kids movie, um, that I think is going to be over the head of a lot of kids. Uh, that's what uh, I thought. Marcel, the shells with shoes on trailer was just left my grandkids say what was that yeah yeah no so this is this is being marketed as kind of a kid's movie it's from a24 which is a you know the the big indie studio um that most recently had success with everything everywhere all at once i know your favorite movie of the year too <laughs> uh, but, uh, but uh but marcel the shell with shoes shoes on is uh it's it's based on a 2010 viral short um, that, uh, you know, racked up tons of YouTube views and people, people loved. Um, and it is, it is a, it's, it's, it's a stop motion animation picture that basically posits like, what if the, you know, the little, uh, I, I don't know how to describe them, the kitschy little, you know, uh, shells with googly eyes or whatever, what if they were actually alive? And it, it, it kind of, it follows there's there there are two there are two parts of the story the okay is, we're, we're out of time on marcel the uh, shell with shoes on sonny that's not it's gonna fun. make it's it's fun <laughs> kids kids probably won't get it but it's 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 good for adults who have all who right have kids marcel kids. the shell with shoes on gets a thumbs up from sonny bunch follow him on twitter at sonny bunch watch his podcast listen to his podcast across the movie aisle and the bulwark goes to the movies i'll be right back on the hugh hewitt show Morning, Glory America. Bonjour, I, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Next week, Colorado will nominate the Republican to take on the invisible senator in Colorado, Michael Bennett. Uh, he ran for president. Nobody remembers that. Michael Bennett actually doesn't get remembered by anyone. But Michael Bennett will win if the Democrats nominate an unelectable Republican. That's why I'm urging Republicans in Colorado to vote for my guest, Joe O'Day. I don't think that's Joe's picture, actually. Uh, ben, you're going to have to take that down. Joe, how are you? I'm great, Hugh. Thanks for having me on today. Uh, first, let's start and tell people where your website is. It's joeoday.com. It's J-O-E-O-D-E-A.com. Get on there. Throw, throw some cash at me. The Democrats are pounding us here in Colorado with TV ads. Hugh, they put $10 million into an ad campaign here trying to keep me off the ticket. Uh, they must be afraid of a, a, a contractor. I can't believe it. I'm just a first-run guy here, and we've got some attention out of Washington. You know, I got to tell you, I, I just spent a lot of time talking to a contractor this week. I'm up in Maine. And so I was talking to the contractor who's been working on uh, my brother-in-law's place. And he knows stuff. He knows the price of everything. 
He knows everything that's screwed up. He knows what it costs to drive everywhere, and he talks to people. Contractors, it occurred to me, you know, I'd already had you on once, and I know you're going to win next week, but it occurred to me contractors are actually kind of very good candidates because they know stuff. Well, you know, we're, we're out in the market. We're, we see what's happening every day. Um, we're talking to people, too. That's the other thing. Uh, you know, when I get to Washington, I'm not going to forget about working Americans. That's why I'm going there. We've been we've been put down for far too long. Nobody's represented us. Nobody's talking at the Senate about the price of gas. I mean, Michael Bennett's lost his focus. Uh, he's not talking about the economy. They're not talking about the highest crime rate we've had here in Colorado. I don't know about you. We set a record uh, here in Colorado. You, we've got the... Uh, the most auto thefts in the in the nation right here in Colorado, if you can believe that. I can't. Uh, but you also got the most dope in the nation, so maybe that goes together. Joe O'Day, uh, I want people to understand what's going on. Democrats know you can beat Michael Bennett, so they are spending millions of dollars on a Republican who is from the far right of our party and cannot win in 100 years in the general election. And I know that, and you know that, and he knows that. I know people run for their own reasons, and they have dreams, and they can dream big. But I'm just a realist of it. It's like Eric Greitens in Missouri will lose. Joe O'Day could win. So they've spent $10 million. Do Republicans, have they figured this out? You know, uh, they're starting to. I go, I'm all around the state here. We've been, we're working hard. We've got our head down. We're making sure we get out to all the, all the uh, opportunities we can to speak to people and uh, they did a mailer. They've done eight or nine mailers to the House. None of those have anybody's name at the bottom of them. And, and it's been in, it, it really uh, uh, something to see. The electorate here in, in Colorado is smart. They're all asking the same question. Who's paying for all this? Because, you know, legally they're supposed to identify themselves. Uh, they know that I'm the candidate that can win here. Uh, and they're coming out pretty hard against me. I, yeah, uh, two days ago, they sent a group of... Uh, of union reps down to my, uh, my business to try and protest, you know, me being in this race. I mean, they'll stoop to any level to, to maintain power. Uh, they don't have any of the facts. None of the policies are on their side this time. So we're just taking the message to the people. We're hammering it. I mean, it's pretty simple. These guys have lost focus. It's $5 gas. It's 8.5% uh, inflation. It's 30% hike in crime. We got a leaking border that's, uh, you know, bringing fentanyl across and killing our kids. I mean, people are, are fed up, and this is going to be hard on people going forward. I also got to say, Colorado has been a place that a lot of Americans have retreated to, could buy an affordable house. The interest rate on buying that house now is up to uh, 7.5%. They're not going to buy that house. And and so the economy is going to going to suffer. Would you give people Joe O'Day the bio on Joe O'Day, because someone's driving around right now in Colorado. It's early. They're going to work. So they're a working man or woman. And they're listening to me talk to you. And they may not have seen anything. They may not be tuned in. A lot of Americans are unplugged from politics in the, in the early summer. They might be driving down vacation. Tell them who Joe O'Day is. So, you know, I'm a fourth generation Colorado. And broke, I was born and raised here. Uh, went to a, a Mullen High School, which is a, uh, uh, a uh, Catholic uh, uh, all-boys school. Uh, my dad got me a job washing dishes at 13 so I could pay the tuition. Uh, went through the carpenter's apprenticeship program here. I'm a carpenter by trade. And then I, I chased my wife on up to Colorado State University. Got married up there. We started a business in uh, 1983. We employ about 300 families here in Colorado. We build a lot of roads and bridges. Uh, I've been hard at it. Uh, you know what? An average day for me is, is get up at 4 o'clock so I can do payroll and uh, then uh, – you know, get onto the job site by five thirty, quarter six, and and then hit it hard all day, and and just make sure we're grinding. So uh, the fact that these guys are dumping all this money in here doesn't bother me at all. I'll just outwork them. I mean, uh, I know Michael Bennett ain't up right now. Hi, oh, you know that that is my view. Is that Michael Bennett is one of the marks of the twenty twenty two cycle. The the Patty Murray in Washington State is another one that no one expects. I, we expect to beat. Uh, the guy in Georgia. We expect to beat the gal in, in Nevada. We expect to beat the gal in, in New Hampshire. But nobody, uh, the Democrats give us signals of who they know is vulnerable. And they know Michael Bennett is vulnerable. And I think he's vulnerable for one reason. He's invisible. Just like uh, the senator in Nevada. They haven't done anything in six years. Nothing. Zero zip. Yeah, when I go out on the Eastern Plains, I have to explain to people who I'm running against. It's, it, it takes time. You know, they don't know his name. And I, I'm going to tell you right now, money doesn't win these elections. 
it's it's about the coalition that we put together. It's it's about the candidate. Uh, I'm going to work hard for people. They know I'll represent them. Um, we put a huge coalition together here in Colorado. We got we got working guys. We got single parents. We got single moms that are working part time jobs that are behind this campaign. We got Republicans. We got good Trump Republicans, GOP Republicans. We got independents. We got a bunch of disgruntled, disenfranchised Democrats that have jumped on here. We got business leaders. Uh, this is a huge campaign that I put together. It's a grassroots effort, and, and they're not going to keep us down. We'll just keep grinding away at it. Now, the Latino vote is significant in Colorado. It's also moving very decisively nationally towards the Republican Party. Is that happening in Colorado? And Joe, I assume that you've worked with every kind of American, both sexes, all sorts of races. You don't care about the religion. You're just a Catholic contractor. I'll, my guess is that you've actually worked with every kind of Colorado. Oh yeah, you, you know my wife's Hispanic, and uh, so so they're my family, and and uh, they're they're wonderful. They're going to get out and vote, and they are ticked off, and and they've finally woken up to the fact that they're they are aligned with Republicans, and and they're starting to see it, uh, and they're not buying the BS out of the Democratic Party anymore. You know, we 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 hire people at my place for their work ethic. We don't care what color they are. Uh, if you if you're willing to work hard, you can work with me any day of the week, and and that's how I see things. Well, let's talk about the drawback, Joe. You are a Colorado State Ram. My son is a Buffalo. How much does that enter into the campaign? I mean, are the Buffaloes willing to vote for a Ram? Well, I'm telling you, you know, you we've got a lot of good Buffaloes that have worked for me over the years, and that's kind of how Rams do it, right? We hire the right people. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about uh, Jared Polis? He is a uh, He's actually running for president, and he's denying he's running for president. Is he staying away from Bennett, or is he part of this effort to keep Joe O'Day off the ballot by elect by nominating an unelectable Republican? You know, I I, I haven't heard from him much. He's distanced himself from Bennett. I think he knows that I'm going to make I'm going to make old Michael retire this year, so he's kind of kept out of it. But you know, the guy's unbelievable. He's trying to tell everybody that he's responsible for a Tabor refund right now, and he's sending money to to people. It must be an election year. Yeah, you bet. Joe, last question in terms of, of you, just you. When you set out in life and you were washing dishes at 13 because dad thought you should pay for the tuition, and I had that kind of a dad, but I only had to work in the summer, not during the year. Uh, did you expect to be entering politics? You know, I, did, I never thought I'd have to, but uh, I just tell you what, the last couple of years watching what these people are doing to our country and watching what they've done to our state, it's just, it's just totally moving the wrong direction. It's not it's not what I remember. It's, you know, and I, I'm in fear for our country. Uh, the American dream that my wife and I have been so blessed to be able to leave, uh, to live here, it, it's leaving us. It, they're taking that away, and, and we're not going to have that for our kids and our grandkids. And so I just had to get off the couch. I had to do something. Um, we've got a great campaign running. Uh, we're we, we're going to get across the finish line. These, these Democrats won't keep me off the ballot. And, and and we'll be having a chat with you next week, you, about how we're going to beat Michael Bennett. JoeOday.com. J-O-E-O-D-E-A. I have to spell that out for the Steelers fans. I sure hope you don't like the Broncos, uh, Joe. You probably do. But that's... I that's. Un- they're going to be relevant this year, Hugh. I'm over... No, they're not. The Browns are... Un- well, I can't even say that. But, but we'll, we'll come back to that after you're nominated. Joe O'Day, I've already recorded a Salem Media endorsement of you. It'll be running on all of our stations. Good luck. We need you in the race to beat Michael Bennett. We need the Senate back, and we need to give some margin to the Republicans so they can pass things without everyone being in town, which is what right now we're looking at 51 or 52. I'd love to get up to 55, and that's doable this year with Joe O'Day in Colorado. Don't forget, Coloradans, get out and vote Joe O'Day for Republican for Senate. I'll be right back, America. Stay tuned. It's Friday. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. All of you in Oklahoma City and throughout the United States know that I've been covering the Oklahoma Senate race pretty closely. Scott Pruitt is an old friend of mine, and you've been on a couple of times. And of course, Alex Gray is an old friend of mine. He's been on. But Luke Holland is not my friend, but I'm a fair guy. So I want Luke Holland on this morning. He, too, is running for Senate in the Sooner State. Luke Holland, welcome to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Uh, well, I- I'm-, I'm sorry it took us this long, but voting is still a little bit off, right? That's right. Voting actually started yesterday. Hugh, it's really good to be on the show with you, and I look forward to becoming your friend. Uh, that's, uh, that, that goes. If you're the winner, you're the winner. Luke, tell <laughs> people about yourself. I think you work for my buddy Jim, and that's tell right. us about yeah. that. 
Yeah, so I, I grew up in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, which for people outside of the state may know from Phillips 66 and all of their heritage uh, over the last hundred years. Uh, but I served for the last five years as Jim's chief of staff, and especially during the Trump administration, uh, we worked fighting in the trenches together to increase defense spending and to get things back on track after the disastrous Obama administration, uh, and also help get these three conservatives confirmed to the Supreme Court, which are continuing to deliver us great victories, including, uh, hopefully, the overturn of Roe versus Wade even this morning. Now, to be the chief of staff to the United States senator is no mean feat to begin with. But, Luke Holland, I got to tell you my favorite Jim Inhofe story and then ask you about uh, your background. Uh, yeah. Jim was listening to the show one morning when I was pitching sponsorship for kids to go to prison fellowship camp. And he called up and he sponsored five kids on the condition that he knew their name so he could meet with them. I just love wow. your boss. Uh, your your boss know. is a great, great American. I'm sorry he to is. see him go. How did he come to pick you to be his chief of staff? So I, I actually worked for him for a, a little over a decade. Um, I, I started with him right out of college and had an entry-level job, literally sorting mail uh, in the mailroom, and didn't expect to be working for him for as long as I did, but it turns out that I, I really enjoyed the work and I was pretty good at it, and uh, he, he took a liking to me and the, the work that I was able to, to do for him, and eventually it just became kind of a partnership where uh, whatever he was working on, I was right there with him, and um, especially on the on the military issues. You know, he's been the leader of the Armed Services Committee for a number of years, and with all the challenges that we're facing overseas, there's there's no more important issue that we need to address as a federal government than the threats we face abroad, and to make sure that our men and women in uniform have all the resources that they need uh, to address any of those concerns that come up. And so as, a, as Oklahoma's next senator, making sure that we have the strongest fighting force in the world is going to be my top priority. Now, Luke uh, Holland, when I've talked to Alex Gray, who has dropped out, and, or That's Scott Pruitt, who hasn't, they talk and, and, about the tribes. And I do not want the fellow who's, supporting, who's supported by the tribes to win, because yeah. I just think their position is is not com in keeping with American constitutional law. <laughs> Tell us about the race right now. Yeah, it's it's kind of a jump ball right now. Every every statewide office in Oklahoma is on the ballot uh, for the first time in maybe I think it's in decades. I can't remember exactly how long it's been, but the governor, lieutenant governor, and both senators. And there's 13 candidates in this race. Um, there's you know, three or four of us, Scott being one of them, uh, T.W. Shannon, who you just mentioned, and Mark Wayne Mullen and I are, are probably the, the, the four candidates who uh, have the, the best shot. It, we're, a, we're a runoff state, so uh, no one is going to get over 50% in this race. And so we'll find out on Tuesday which two uh, will go to the runoff, which is at the end of August. And so we've had great reception to our message focusing on restoring America's foundation of freedom and Christian values uh, and, and really getting things focused back where they need to be, back to the basics to get this country back on the right track. Couldn't be happier with our campaign, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see the results on Tuesday. I'm very optimistic about my chances of making it to the runoff and then ultimately winning the race and becoming Oklahoma's next senator. So I want, I want people to understand, Mr. Shannon is not a bad man. He just bought and paid for by the tribes. And the tribes want McGirt to remain the law of the United States. And I want McGirt to be overturned. I think it will be when another case comes up. Where do you stand on McGirt, Luke Holland? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see what case comes out. There's a case right now at the Supreme Court that we might get a decision on today that could limit McGirt to just criminal uh, activities. Right now, there's huge jurisdictional challenges in eastern Oklahoma about law enforcement. I actually talked to a sheriff not too long ago who was visited by the FBI after he returned fire uh, at a house that he responded to. And he was visited by the FBI because it turns out that the person inside the house was a, was a tribal member. And uh, he was told that he didn't have jurisdiction to do that. So that's the kind of confusion that you just can't have among law enforcement. And if we're able to limit the issues of McGirt to just criminal, which we don't know if we can yet or not, but if we can just limit it to criminal, then I think that we'll be able to figure out a solution to it. If it extends beyond 
criminal to tax or regulatory issues, then it does become a, a whole other box of you know, can of worms that needs to be needs to be addressed. But I, I'm I'm very passionate about ensuring that all Oklahomans uh, have the same kind of opportunities and rights as, as anybody else. So, Luke Holland, you did not mention, are you a Sooner or a Cowboy, or did you go to a football <laughs> school in the Big Ten? <laughs> I actually went to the University of Arkansas, so which is not too far. Oh, my I got, gosh. I got lured across the border to be a Razorback, and, and uh, so I'm disappointed that we're not making it to the College World Series this year. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually where I grew up. It's equally distant from uh, OU, Oklahoma State, and Arkansas. They're all pretty close to the same drive, so all I got right, pulled so- over there. No, there's no football there either, so it doesn't matter. I was just hoping you were a Baker Mayfield guy who's going to be a Seattle Seahawk pretty soon. So, Luke Collin, what is the website? What is the money situation? And how? when do people vote? And is there early yep. voting in Oklahoma? There, There is early voting. That started yesterday, so people can vote today and tomorrow. And then, of course, Election Day is on Tuesday. My website is LukeHolland.com. And, uh, yeah, please go online, donate money. If, you, uh, if you're encouraged by my campaign, we, the more the merrier. We can get our message out there and make sure we uh, get to victory. Are you, are you traveling with Senator Inhofe? This, I don't know if he can leave D.C. They're working on a lot of well, stuff. Well, we, we were planning on making some stops today, but they, they just finished late last night, so I don't think he's going to make it back in time for him to join me. But, yeah, we'll be going around this weekend to uh, the, the whole state. Yeah, you're traveling with St. Jim. In Oklahoma, yeah. right? It's, that's, that's, right. A, that's like having the, this, you know, a, a miraculous vision when you're out with Jim Inhofe. <laughs> and so that's right. good luck that's to you this right. weekend, Luke. And, hey, uh, and we'll, if you are the nominee, we will be 100% with you. And if you're in the runoff, we'll be talking to you again very soon. Great. I appreciate your joining us this morning. LukeHolland.com, right? Yeah, that's right. Thanks so much, you. Great to talk be to well. you. Be well. It's just so easy to talk to Jim Inhofe's chief of staff. I mean, see, Jim Inhofe is really a great American. Welcome back, America. Joining me from Israel is Dr. Michael Oren, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, former deputy minister in the uh, about two Netanyahu governments ago. And I'm so glad you could make it this morning, Dr. Oren, because the question on my mind is whether or not Bibi can pull together a new coalition over the weekend before the Knesset is dissolved and the interim government takes over. What's the answer? Um, and nobody knows. He's huh. about one seat short. One seat short. He's <laughs> very tantalizing. Uh, he's got to get one member of the coalition to bolt and come over to him, uh, promising that member uh, the sky. He could be foreign minister, he could be any ministry he wants or she wants uh, if they come over. Um, chances of doing it depends on whether I've said it before on the program here whether he can bury the hatchet uh, with those who want to bury the hatchet in him um, and sort of. Move on. Uh, those people being Benny Gantz, the fourth, the defense minister, who has nine seats, uh, with uh, Gidon Saar, the justice minister, uh, who has uh, about five seats, um, with a, a, the second member of the Amina party, of uh, Bennett's own party, Ayala Chiquette, uh, whether she can get any of these three individuals to come over with enticements. Now, do they, you know, I've seen them all say, no, 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 we're not doing that. Does no mean no? Never. Never. Okay. <laughs> Even the Polly Bennett himself, who said, they're talking about politics here, uh, who said he would never uh, sit with an Arab party. He sat with an Arab party, said he would never sit with Yair Lapid. He ended up sitting with Yair Lapid. No, no usually means yes uh, under certain circumstances. Um, and those circumstances, when it comes to Netanyahu, are particularly weighty because there's a lot of personal baggage here. But but Bennett is being announced as as going to take a break, more time with his family stuff. He's done, isn't he? I mean, he's finished. Uh, Yamina is done. As if I read the polling right, they could they could slip below whatever it is three percent, four percent. I don't know what it is in Israel. You got to get so many votes before you get a seat, right? Yeah, and taking a break means he's coming back. <laughs> like like no means yes. Taking a break means I'm go- I'm coming back. <laughs> uh, but I'm coming back after 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 I you know I reorganize. And- uh, and reinforce my political base. Uh, he's got to create a new political party, Bennett, if he wants to come back. He will. There, there's actually a rule of thumb in Israeli politics, Hugh. You can leave Israeli politics once and come back. You cannot leave Israeli politics twice and come back. Bibi himself uh, resigned from Israeli politics after he lost the 1999 elections and he came back. Arik Sharon left Israeli politics uh, after he 
uh, was forced out of government uh, after the Sabra Chitila massacre back in, in 1982. He came back. You can't come back uh, twice once. So Bennett's got, a, got another shot at it. So here's the thing you told me a couple of weeks ago, is that members of Knesset who know they will not come back to the Knesset in the new elections, which will be held in late October, early November, are have the greatest incentive to join a BB coalition that replaces the current government. Can a member of the party like uh, New Hope uh, just break with their leader? And can can BB assemble 61 from uh, refugees from uh, parties that are on the decline? Yes. And, and James, New Hope right now is polling uh, below the threshold. You have to get about 30,000 seats, roughly, uh, per uh, per, per seat in Knesset, and you got to get five of them, so it's 150,000. Got to get their polling lower than that. Uh, so there's an incentive there. There's an incentive for Ayala Chiquette, number two in the uh, Yamina party, which is also now polling uh, beneath the threshold to move over. Benny Goldgans is, is polling above the threshold, but he'll never be prime minister. And the only way he'll be prime minister is in a rotation agreement with Netanyahu, where uh, Benny Gantz would be prime minister first. So uh, let's get the, the uh, Michael Oren line. Uh, what are the odds of a Prime Minister Netanyahu this time on Monday? Um, I would give it 65%. I really would. Wow. Um, he's that close. He's that close. People do not want to go to elections. Everyone has seen uh, that the results of elections may be the same as the previous five elections and would be still in a deadlock. There is some indication that Netanyahu's position and that of the, the Israeli right in general has improved uh, over the last year, uh, and that maybe that improvement will put them over the top in the next election. But it's a big if, and it'll be uh, much more preferable. Much Michael, more I want to get one question. The, the specter of Iran becoming a nuclear power is there. Uh, uh, doesn't that have to help Netanyahu? And it has to help them. Now, it also could have to help Pierre Lapid. Uh, the president's coming. President Biden's coming. And he's going to do for Pierre Lapid what Trump did for, 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 for Bibi. He's going he's gonna to hug. He's going to hug Pierre Lapid. And, if he gets uh, there, he I'm might be hugging Bibi, Trump. right? He might be hugging Bibi. No, he probably could be hugging Bibi. Yes, he could be hugging Bibi. But if, there's, if we're going to elections, he'll be hugging Pierre Lapid. Oh, my and gosh. That would be very good electorally for Pierre Lapid. Your, your system. I must say, Dr. Oren, thank you for translating it for us every single week. Michael Oren can be found on Twitter, Dr. Michael Oren, Dr. Michael Oren, Dr. Michael Oren. And he will be, uh, I hope, tweeting throughout the weekend as developments occur in Israel. Thank you, Dr. Oren. Coming up next, the Hilltale Dialogue America, Dr. Larry Oren. Larry Oren and I uh, are back. Dr. Oren did a course on the ethics a few years ago with 12 Hillsdale students that's on video. So if you will download the Salem News cha channel. Ben, Mr. Tech up here in the wild of the north has been listening to this. He loves it. Everybody loves it. You should listen to it, but you should watch it too. Download the Salem News channel app and get to work. I'll be right back with Dr. Arn in part three of the ethics. On the